In the biblical timeline, it's been a week or a little less than a week. And Jesus has indeed appeared in front of his, disi his disciples. The word has gotten out. Except for one. And if you take a look at this and look at the the scriptures, we've heard about we've heard this story ever since we were in Sunday school way back when. And this particular account is one of those one of those what we Bible stories, Bible accounts, scripture passages, whatever you want to call it, that can be preached almost every month, maybe in some cases every week, because it speaks to the human condition about the nature of faith, which is why we are here. But it's also why we, as humans, are always striving to be something more with God's help. Amen? This is in John 20, starting at verse 19. Everybody can hear me okay? On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked in fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. With that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, which is Greek for the twin, <coughs> one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was, was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Pray with me, please. May your words be my words, and may your message be my message to your people today. In your name I pray. Amen. I want to give you a profile of a man. This was a very successful 
follower of Christ. This man, through historical documents of the first and late first centuries, founded the church in what is now India. To this day, the church that bears his name has 4.6 million members in a predominantly non-Christian non country. Not only in India, but also in Syria. There is a shrine that contains his remains in the towns of Chennai, India, and also in Italy. That person was Thomas. That Thomas? Doubting Thomas? When to after Thomas leaves the biblical timeline, and when the disciples went all over the world to preach the name of Jesus, he was repu is reputed to have founded the church in India and did most of his missionary activities there. And now there is a, an orthodox, a branch of the orthodox church called the St. Thomas Christians that number of almost 1.6 million in India alone. And even with all of the strife and war that's going on in Syria, there are St. Thomas Christians there as well as all over the world. But this is doubting Thomas. If you look up in any book or internet website, and you put the word doubting, Thomas will follow. I was looking for a video for to add to the service today of about two minutes about just a little capsule profile of, of who Thomas was. But there are so many sermons that are, that exist out that exist out there defending Thomas getting on Thomas's case, saying he should have believed, saying that he was this, saying that he was that. Thomas has become a lightning rod in what it means to what it means to believe in the life of the church. And quite frankly, there isn't a lot of biblical evidence of Thomas's life. All we know is from just a few scripture passages, one I just read to you. The other comes from the following. This is from John 11, 16, where, John, where um, Thomas says, Go so that we may die with him. In regards to being Jesus calling the disciples to follow him in the midst of persecution, but also... In John 14, 5, one of the most inspiring and heart-rending pieces of Scripture where Jesus is telling his disciples that he is going to die, he, he says, It's pretty bad. Can't read your own handwriting. And I have neat handwriting, but my vision is not that great sometimes. <clears throat> he said, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And of course, Jesus responds, I am the way and the truth and the life. That's all we know. And in those couple of pieces of scripture, Thomas seems to be more of a person of faith than he is a person of doubt. And in, but we know that he is this. We 
We know that he is a person that had a moment of doubt in a very, very trying time for the disciples. Unfortunately, he is known by this passage. This is 2025 of John. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. This is meant to be taken not only literally, but taken to its absolute most extreme meaning. There is no way he's going to show up. It's not just doubt, but it's almost rebellion that Thomas did at that time. You know, there have been times where doubt can be enveloping more than a wet blanket but something that can make, make you not want to hear anything more. Ah, I can't hear anymore. I can't hear you. It didn't happen. I don't want to know anything more about it. It's literally something where it, it's an, it paralyzes you. Sometimes our, our minds try to anesthetize us from further pain, but in truth, it also often causes more, it doesn't cause any more pain, but it causes one never to move at all. Thomas, I think, was at this point. Why the other disciples weren't, I don't know. But again, as I said before this sermon started, this is, a, this is a scripture that we need to preach more often than just the next Sunday after Easter. Because doubt is often seen as the enemy of faith. But in reality, inaction is more the enemy of faith than doubt. Does that make sense? Not doing anything at all is the enemy of faith. But then there's doubting Thomas. Doubt, doubt, doubt. That's all he did. When Jesus was given, was, testi was testified about by his fellow disciples, by his, by his friends, by his brothers, Jesus came back. He's back. He went from doubt to rebellion. But Thomas didn't stay there. Jesus, of course, helped with that. <clears throat> In verse 27, Jesus said, Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. What Jesus did is that Jesus met Thomas where he was, not just in the doubt, but Jesus met him at the point of his rebellion. Did Jesus say, uh, you know, you didn't believe me, so, you know, go out into the land of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Or he didn't just 
meet the other disciples and leave Thomas in the dark. Jesus had such love for this man that he met Thomas where he was in the moment of his rebellion, in the moment of his doubt. And Thomas, therefore, believed. Instead of allowing his doubt to be so paralyzing, petrifying, something that would have made him not move from that place of doubt for the rest of his days. Thomas believed. Thomas moved on. Thomas received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Thomas did what he did on the Indian subcontinent where a church today has his name on it. And ultimately, Thomas died for his Savior. Don't know how, but the only disciple that did not die a martyr's death was John. Thomas believed, but we never hear the believing Thomas. <laughs> it doesn't have quite that same rhetorical ring to it. He doubted. You don't have to raise your hands on this, but I will. How many of you have ever had doubts as part of your faith? It's doubts have been made to be the enemy of faith. <coughs> but they only are the enemy of faith if we do nothing and stay there. Doubts are kind of like the turnpike rest stops of our, of, our, of our lives. Have any of you done a lot of traveling on the, on the roads? Done mostly driving instead of flying? There are great rest stops around the country. There are places that you can freshen up, get something to eat, get a map. Remember those? There were, there were these things that had directions on them, you know? And when sarcastic pastor comes out. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. Uh, um, to get a map, to get directions. They're great places. There are even places where you, maybe you could play frisbee or do whatever. But they're not places to stay. They never have been. They're places to freshen up and they're places so that after you freshen up you go on your journey again. Doubt is the very acts very much in that same way. We ask questions. We talk to God about it. But doubt is never a place that we should stay. Similarly, an airport is very much the same way. Has any of you ever been at an airport for more than 10 hours? God bless you. They're nice. You do a lot of good shopping there. Watch the planes, maybe have a good bite to eat. But they are not places to stay. They never were. That's, even the hotels that are nearby are not places where people live. They're places where people may stay for a night or go on their journey. Doubt is one of those places. Hear these words, and this comes from Acts 2, 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. 
Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw that what seemed to be the tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them, and all of them were filled, in, filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were, now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Moving on to verse 14. Then Peter stood with the eleven and raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out, pour out on my spirit on those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming and the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Why am I reading you the Pentecost passage? Because that, along with Jesus meeting him where he was, was the, was the last linchpin of what Thomas and the other disciples needed to have no doubt to be filled by the Holy Spirit and for them to go out into the world. It was for them to receive the Holy Spirit in such a way that there was no more doubt in their minds. At that point they could go and serve Jesus, serve and witness to the name of Jesus Christ in the world. The common denominator out of all of this is that he, need, this is Thomas I'm speaking of, needed to be in communication with God. He needed to doubt openly, and he did it in front of his disciples. In so doing, Jesus was able to meet Thomas where he was. How can we do the same when we doubt? Number one, listen. Listen. For those of you who are parents, how many of you knew when your children were sick <coughs> before they had their first cough or they told you they were sick. Right? Dr. Cook, you knew when people, what was going on, <coughs> but before you read a chart, you could go into their office and you would know what was going on. When you love somebody that much, when you want to serve somebody that much, you're attuned to what they need. <coughs> Amen? When you listen for God, instead of, worth, in, instead of looking at our children and knowing what they need or knowing that they're sick, God knows what we need. And God knows that we need uh, God, then we know what to tell God because we know God is listening. Amen? The second, this is the hardest part, I think, is to wait. We 
tell God what we need and when we need it. And then it's waiting for Him to answer. Luckily, in this situation, he, in this situation, Thomas didn't have to wait all that long. We may have to wait even longer. With that being said, learn to wait for the Holy Spirit to come and give you answers. And the third <coughs> is act. When you have the answers you need, erase your doubt and be able to go and do what he asks you to do. Because doubt is not a place where we can stay. But doubt is a place that we can learn from and take those lessons that God has given to us wherever we are sent to glorify His name. I'll close with this. Peter said, Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God had raised this Jesus to life, and we were all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out for what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, yet, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this, that God made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Doubt is something we all deal with. Doubt is something that is a normal part of our faith. But doubt is not a place where we should stay. Listen, wait, and act upon God giving you what you need, even if you are in that place of rebellion, so that you, wherever you're sent, may be able to do so that Jesus has answered your prayers and that you can witness to his resurrection.